All right, so let's jump right up into chapter five. Chapter five is called Building a Grassroot Movement for Healing and for Justice. And it has a picture of us at the summit. The summit is going to be a big part of this chapter. So this chapter, in summary, is really talking about our participatory action research work that we describe within our movement work of building um, from circle to circle with young people in New York City and across the nation around healing, around healing that comes from us, and then bringing us all together. Um, and the summit is one of the places where we bring ourselves all together after having individual circles and conversations about what healing means. And as I said in the methodological chapter that the epistemological soundtrack to this dissertation is like liberation psychology. Shout out to Martine Botto. Um, and liberation psychology is really talking about how do you liberate psychology? How do you use um, psychology from the methodological standpoint, epistemological standpoint of the people? to serve the people, to work for the people? Um, and how do you liberate yourself um, as you engage in that process? So I open up this chapter um, with like an epistemological soundtrack note, and it's a quote from Fred Hampton. And it reads, open quote, if you ever think about me, and if you think about me, N-word, and if you ain't going to do no revolutionary act, forget about me. I don't want myself on your mind. If you're not going to, if you're not going to work for the people, like we always say, if you're asked to make a commitment at the age of 21, and you say I don't want to make a commitment only because the simple reason that I'm too young to die, I want to live a little bit longer. What you did is you're already dead. You have to understand that people have to pay a price for peace. If you dare to struggle, you dare to win. If you dare not to struggle, then God damn it, you don't deserve the win. Let me say peace to you if you're willing to fight for it, Fred Hampton. Let me further close, close quote. I open the chapter up by saying, the research practice I co-led during Holler's participatory investigation evolved from the spirit of liberation psychology and a commitment to the people, echoed in the above quote by Fred Hampton. Fred Hampton's opening quote embodies a spirit to sustain a collective we, a spirit of movement building, a spirit of journeying together with chosen family, a spirit of co-struggling, a spirit of individual and collective sacrifice, a participatory spirit of co-creating liberation and fighting for freedom in community with community. Later in that same speech, Hampton asked the audience some serious spiritual questions that I still honor today. They ground Hala and me as we journey through our healing justice movement building process. Hampton asked, why don't you live for the people? Why don't you struggle for the people? Why don't you die for the people? These questions were posed within the context of unaddressed spiritual wellness, persistent state violence, ongoing interpersonal violence within communities of color impacted by historical violence. His questions surveys individuals' willingness to engage in a praxis of collective sacrifice and commitment. So we uplift Fred's questions as like a soundtrack to this chapter, to like a soundtrack to like youth development, to like a soundtrack to like grassroots movement building, particularly in the context of urban communities impacted by the historical problem of violence. So in this chapter of the dissertation, chapter five, I share two interrelated results un uncovered through my participatory data analysis with the Youth Organizing Collective, which was a long process of us um, taking all of the surveys and evaluations and uploading them to an online program and putting 
making a, a, a blank table sheet and then putting each question to the survey, each question to the evaluation um, under its own table chart. And then we put each response to each question in its own table box within the table chart under the question that that response was in. And then we made four copies of the table chart for the survey, four copies of the table chart for the evaluations with each question and each response and all of the table charts. And then we broke our team up into four groups of twos and threes. And then each group had their own copy of all of the survey and evaluation responses in the table chart. And they coded each question using the responses um, for the survey. And then they coded each question um, using the responses for the evaluations. And then when we all finished coding them, we came back together as a team and each of the four groups presented to each other. And as one group present, the other group would take notes. Um, when they finish presenting, we'll ask questions. We'll look at responses. Um, if we didn't understand why you coded something, um, we'll ask further questions. In those conversations, some things um, got reaffirmed, some things got double coded, and some things got changed to other codes that other young people had in other groups that felt more relatable to the responses. Um, we did this iterative over like nine months until we had a coding scheme. So that was the participatory data analysis. Um, I also did critical eth ethnographer analysis of all of our large community of forms, particularly in this chapter, the Hill and Justice Summit, um, where we brought in all of those circles together to experience two days of sharing relationship, culture, um, and each other and our families with each other and ideas with each other and skills with each other as a form of building a healing justice movement. Um, the findings highlight the importance of, you know, movement building as research that, and particularly participatory action research that centers healing that blurs the line between method and action and action as a throughway project of the entire PAR process. So we talk about doing circles um, all across the project, all 80 circles, and then having large events, you know, the summit, the talent show, holiday, bringing those circles together. Uh, we're talking about those circles as healing happened while we learning about healing at the same time. Um, so that was really talking about healing as a throughway project. We didn't wait to the end of the project to start thinking about action or to start thinking about healing. Um, B, that centers vulnerability as an axis of interpersonal healing to engage vulnerability as a ritual of storytelling. So we learned that vulnerability was really important um, and that hope and spirit um, slash vulnerability is like a really important energy that moves across the movement building process. So there was two um, really concrete, large findings that really summarize all of that. The first one was vulnerability as emotional knowledge. Going back to our six large findings, two of them showed up here. Vulnerability as emotional knowledge for healing is the first one. And it had two sub themes. We'll talk about those later. And the second big one was building a grassroots movement as healing. And it had three sub themes. And we'll talk about those a little bit later as well. So let's first start off with vulnerability as emotional knowledge for healing. The first big result in this chapter um, out of the six dissertation big findings is um, vulnerability as emotional knowledge for healing. It has two sub themes in this chapter. The first one is vulnerability sees vulnerability. And this captures my analysis when you've shared emotions with each other that opened up more space for youth to share emotions with each other towards healing. The second sub theme in vulnerability as emotional knowledge for healing, healing is vulnerability as a praxis of truth telling for healing. And this captures my analysis of the critical feedback from the evaluations. 
um, that we receive from the young people in the 30 circles that experienced the healing circle in our survey with us. So when cultivating an experience dynamic, or in, in this case, a healing justice movement building circle process, vulnerability was uplifted as an access as an axis to practice the relational healing. One participant reflecting on the circle process said, the students in YOC had an opportunity to try on vulnerability and to explore radical love and healing. Vulnerability within this chapter is interpreted as an action verb, a noun, a political action, a process of self-reflection, the sharing of personal stories and testimonies, and when youth experience healing with each other. Other times, our analysis position vulnerability as an ingredient that brings together the intersections of shame, love, guilt, pride, pain, dreams, the stories, stories not shared, healing, and much more. Across my analysis, we documented youth responses of how the healing circles allow more room for vulnerability. The cultivation of vulnerability facilitated permission for youth to build deeper with themselves and each other. So let's go talk about vulnerability, seize vulnerability a little more clearly, the first sub point. So when vulnerability grows and fosters within urban youth interpersonal relationships, the how? and young people's ability to listen to other young people's truth and to share truth with other young people's changes. So when we introduce vulnerability to how we listen to other young people, truths um, and sh how they share their truth changes, it's different. Vulnerability allows relational roots to grow deeper connections to one another. Vulnerability is important for movement building um, and personal healing. So when you're thinking about youth development and the historical um, problem of violence and the structural and interpersonal and inter internalized problem of violence, vulnerability is really important in that process of personal development and movement building. In one instance, we heard from young people. I think it was dope because we have been with each other all year. And when Holla slash YLC came through, y'all still managed to make us learn something from each other. So talking about how there's always more space for vulnerability, even when you think you know each other. Across our movement-based research, we documented testimonies of vulnerability being shared. Here's another quote. I enjoy learning more about my peers and seeing and hearing YOC slash holler thoughts about vulnerability. Another quote. I've never been asked these challenging questions before, and that made us think deeply. I also like being listened to so attentively. Close quote. Let's read a little bit more of what I said. Vulnerability functions as a source of familiarity, maybe even comfortability, that serve as a buffer of trust for engagement and collective holding and knowing and understanding of each other's truth slash wisdoms. So we say vulnerability like makes you feel like you know somebody when you're sharing similar pain and similar experiences of, of like, oh, I'm not the only one going through this that adds another layer of holding in the conversation and knowing in the conversation. Let's keep reading. Creating brave spaces held by a praxis of vulnerability. So when you intentionally create spaces that bring in ancestors and elders and invite vulnerability in, it opens up new ways, maybe even deeper ways and pathways of knowing the self knowing the self to your, to other people you're journeying with and knowing the self to the world. So vulnerability was communicated as a chance to build and connect. Let's listen to what a young person said. It allowed me to talk with someone that I never talked with about some deep stuff. In other cases we heard, it allowed me for connecting. We also heard, I liked how open and inviting everyone was. I felt very comfortable with them. They were willing to listen. We also heard talking to people in their company that everybody came together to talk about their personal problems slash issues. Sitting in circles, having small groups, individuals going through many community problems. 
These are all things we heard about why sharing vulnerability and what vulnerability felt like and sounded like. Um, when we discover sharing mutual vulnerabilities, the healing circle process is a ritual that open up space for shared vulnerabilities between urban young people, a space for hearing, digesting stories of violence and healing and a space to stimulate emotional connection between urban youth. In doing so, the emotional connection serve as a source of knowledge to better understand and articulate the violence or articulate the healing and to deepen urban youth's emotional analysis. The healing circle served as an invitation to share multiple vulnerabilities. Here's what the young people said, because it all caused us to become more vulnerable and make us think and talk to people we usually don't. Cool. Strategizing about violence and healing is an emotional process. Holding space for another youth story of violence is hard work. Feeling strong enough or safe enough to share one emotional work related to violence is equally hard. Our circle process um, across the 80 circles, but particularly here in this research focus here, the 30 circles, um, really assist the young people with getting under the emotional numbness and around internalized violence to create a safer new emotional understanding um, and for new emotional realities to emerge. This is where we learn where the healing is at as well. Um, you've shared many reflections that tap into emotional knowledge on a personal level, such as, and this is what we heard, the circle made me express feelings that I've never been, that I've been holding for a long time. The circle made me feel things I never felt before. The circle made me think and feel more comfortable about talking about myself. There were reflections that tap into emotional knowledge on an interpersonal level as healing as well. We heard the circle made us more vulnerable plus open. We heard the circle helped people open up, say and tell things that they usually don't talk about. We heard I began to hear where others really felt. So that was some of the stuff that we learned when we talked about vulnerability sees vulnerability. Let's keep it going. The, the circle process was a place to, and this is what young people said, to really think about some questions and to articulate some responses. They also said, or to talk about my problems and story out. Youth experienced the circle process as a place to express my feelings more in a more effective way. The organizing pedagogy of vulnerability allows space to help youth understand how other youth feel oppressed and how we can heal each other. It is important to communicate. That's what a young person said. Across the circle process, participants communicated a desire to be more vulnerable, to be more vulnerable with themselves and with each other. Participants expressed a need to be in spaces that allow access to vulnerability. Within our circle process, vulnerability was uncovered as an access driving the healing process, particularly in regards to emotional development, multiple understandings of violence, multiple understandings of healing and relationship building amongst urban youth who experience violence and need healing. So that was vulnerability sees vulnerability.